built the team that brought back-to-back -back pennants to Arlington. I would say between text and emails, probably 150 to 200 a day. Hired at just 28 years old, he has grown into the job and his celebrity. You know, the guys all give me crap about it. Somebody stop and ask for my autograph. He's a husband, a father, and the most successful general manager in Texas Rangers history. But it's a high-pressure, fast-paced world. I've gotten better about putting my phone down and walking away from it. I had to like go see a therapist for a while to help me with that. This is In My Own Words, John Daniels, next. His youth is, is uh, an asset to us. Uh, he's the youngest general manager in the history of Major League Baseball. He's 28 years old in one month. At the end of the day, uh, Buck is my, my manager. He's a great manager, but John Daniels will be the general manager. So with that, I'd like to introduce the new general manager of the Texas Rangers. John the age thing has worn off over time. I think just like anybody, whether you're you know, 28 or 68, I mean, it's about production. It was a novelty when I first got the job. I mean, I, you know, I, I when I speak, and I usually say that, you know, two questions I got every time when, when uh, I would do Q&A or talk to fans were, you know, how old are you and when are you guys going to get some pitching? I mean, th those are the two things I heard all the time. And so I think uh, now we're at a point where, you know, what we've done as a, as a baseball group and the good people we've been able to bring in and on and off the field and, and you know, the team's performance and what we're doing with you know, the number of fans and the popularity and, and the things we do in the community. At the end of the day, I think that speaks more you know, about who we are and what we're about than you know, my age or anybody else's age. Um, but it was, you know, no doubt it was a novelty for a period of time. The baseball operations group you've assembled, why do you think that's been so effective? Our people are good at what they do, and, um, and we allow them to do what they're good at. And, um, you know, I mean, it, it, listen, it, it's a dream uh, to be a you know, major league GM and then be involved in a baseball operations department, period, but to also get to work with and travel with, you know, some of my, you know, closer friends. And, 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 uh, and that's not to say we agree on everything all the time. We, you know, we fight and argue and, and uh, battle and get pissed at each other and don't talk for two days and then come back at it. And, and ultimately, we all kind of want the same thing, and that's to win. I mean, the fact that you've allowed that back and forth, you think that maybe helps no in the doubt. big picture? Listen, if everyone's gonna if everyone is going to tell, you know, the ultimate decision maker what he or she wants to hear, then you don't need more than one person. You know, and I think what makes us effective is we we do argue and we do debate and we do have a difference of opinions. But at the end of the day, when we come to an agreement, everybody's on board. You know, there's nothing I, I hate more than the occasion where you'll read about it in the media that, you know, so-and-so and the Rangers wanted this player and so-and-so didn't. I mean, that's BS and that's unproductive and, and um, you know, I, I can't stand that. I mean, we're, we stand together, we win together, we lose together and, and, and things like that are divisive and we've been fortunate to really minimize that. Your assistant general manager, Thad Labine, says that the art of general managing that seems to have slowed down for you. Would you agree with that? When we were getting going in 06 and 07 and building the foundation in 08, you know, I, you know, there was like a million things to do every day. There still are, but we've got so many good people in place that, you know, I don't need to be involved in every decision, involved in every day. And you know, I, you know, I love and trust Wash and trust, you know, trust what he's doing at the big league club. And I trust, you know, all the guys on the scouting side and the development side. And you know, I know that things are being taken care of. So it's a little easier for me to step back and, and be a little more selective on the things that I'm, I'm really focusing in on day in day out. Um, but it's also it's experience, you know, like anything else. And the more you do something, the more comfortable you get. Uh, the, the, you know, the success we've had has helped. You feel more confident, more comfortable in your own skin. You've been through it before, so you know there's oh, there's your first trade deadline, your first draft, your first winter meetings, your first spring training, your first hiring, your first firing. You know all the all the things that. You know, th there's no manual to help you through. Um, you know, some of the stuff we've dealt the, the bankruptcy, the ownership change, you know, that nobody prepares you for that. And, and um, um, so I think having gone through all those things has helped not just me, but us as a group kind of you know, redefine who we are and, and uh, what we're about. 
And on that vein, uh, I think it's pretty well known that a couple of the early moves didn't work as the organization might have thought. Sure. But when you talk to people around baseball, one of the things that uh, they're most impressed with is how that didn't make you gun shy, how you, you were assertive before, you're assertive since. I wondered if that was an early hurdle for you or if you just made it look easy. It's just who we are. You know, we, we are, um, we're not like gunslingers. It's not, you know, we're not here to take crazy risks, but we are not scared of risk either. You know, I think what it comes down to is we trust the work that we've done. We traded uh, two, two uh, pitchers, Edison Volquez and Danny Ray Herrera to Cincinnati for the large left-hander to my, to my right, Josh Hamilton. I think when, you, when you're confident that you've done the work on the front end, it, it helps minimize some of the risk in making some of these moves, and it just, it's a little easier to do. But that, that's in our DNA as a group. You know, we're just, you know, we don't want safe players, and we want championship caliber players and guys that have chances to, you know, to win games for you in big spots. And I think to get that type of player and that type of culture in the organization, you've got to be willing to push the envelope a little bit. I went upstairs to, you know, uh, check in on Lincoln. I, and he, he rarely wakes up, but he woke up, kind of popped up, and he said, Dad, did we win? You know, is, is there going to be a parade? And I was like, to have to tell him no there at 3 o'clock in the morning, that was the first time that, you know, I, that I, I really felt it. It's a 24-7, 365 business. So, you know, I think Thanksgiving Day or July 4th or, you know, Saturday night or Sunday morning, it doesn't matter, you know. And, you know, and so people, people understand that there's a balance and, Especially now with cell phones, I think it used to be a little bit more cut and dry when everyone basically had each other's office lines, and that was it. You know, if you were in, you, you had a conversation. If you weren't, you didn't. I think now with cell phones, people understand that half the time they're going to get you. You're going to be somewhere you might not be able to talk. What would be a typical day in the life of John Daniels? Typically, the, the kids are our alarm clock. They'll get us up in the morning. Um, and, you know, the good thing about this job is that, you know, we're somewhat flexible. Uh, the whole industry is kind of up late at night, so you know early mornings there's not too much going on. Uh, so I'm able to stay home with the kids a little bit, you know, get them off to school, or in the summers even spend an hour or two with them in the morning. Uh, get into get into the office, um, you know. Hopefully uh, get get a little thing, a few things done before lunch. Typically go out with some of the guys in the office and catch up over lunch on a few things. You know, make calls and, and work through the afternoon. You know, check in with Wash and the staff. Uh, you know, before the game, any sort of you know appearances or media type availability, uh, usually before the game, uh, dinner, watch the game, and then after the game, you know, a lot of times we'll I'll meet with Wash and go over it and um, um, head back home and start over again. Is Lincoln old enough to kind of understand what Dad does? And yeah, he's just got you know his new thing is he wants every night when I get home. I'm supposed to wake him up, and he always asks me if we won or lost. So uh, um, that's actually the, the, the people ask about the you know, the World Series and w how tough it was, and really it was only one moment that was really that tough. I mean, obviously very disappointing, and, and uh, you know it was a, it was a bit of a gut punch for the whole organization. But I think for the most part we turned it over pretty quick and used it as a, a motivator. But I remember we got home from um, St. Louis at Friday night, probably about two, three in the morning by the time I got into, got back home. And I went upstairs to, you know, uh, check in on Lincoln. And, I, and he, he rarely wakes up, but he woke up, kind of popped up, and he said, Dad, did we win? You know, is, is there going to be a parade? And I was like, because I you know, obviously told him about that as a possibility. And I had to, to have to tell him no there at 3 o'clock in the morning. That was the first time that, you know, I, that I, I really felt it. But, um, no, he's, he's been great. He loves coming out to the games, uh, you know, loves Nelly Cruz, loves the fireworks, and loves uh, the groundskeepers. Those are his uh, three favorite parts. And in this day and age, a lot of people communicate by text. Any idea how many you get a day? Yeah, I was trying to get, I, I would say between text and emails, probably, you know, 150 to 200 a day. You know, I mean, it depends on the time of year. You know, sometimes they are slower than others. Um, you know, April is a fairly slow month. You know, as things are just picking up. August slows down a little bit after the trade deadline. You know, January, uh, beginning of February, once the team's settled, is, is kind of slow. But uh, you know, you can imagine around around the the draft, around the trade deadline, 
winter meetings, uh, GM meetings, really from middle November till New Year's is, is pretty hectic. Um, it, there's ebbs and flows. How's that go over at home? I mean, the young kids want your undivided attention. Yeah, I've had to learn to get a little better about that. I, I, I've gotten better about putting my phone down and walking away from it. I, I think I had to like go see a therapist for a while to, to help me with that. Um, uh, there's still some times where Robin has to like, you know, you know, somehow get my attention and remind me that I'm I'm around other people and I can't be lo too locked in on the phone. Um, you know, I like emails and texts because it enables me, or I, I feel like it enables me to, to still be there, uh, at least physically, if not fully mentally, while I'm taking care of something else. But um, you know, I've tried to I've tried to carve out a little more time and, and put the phone down, but I'm still not very good at it. Outwardly, you seem to have a calm demeanor. You rarely change expression. I just wondered if you actually feel the stress of the job. Yeah, I and mean, how I, you deal with it? I'll probably bury it, and I'll probably have some medical issues <laughs> later in life. Um, uh, you know, that's just my demeanor. I mean, I'll I'll, I'll have um, you know emotional peaks and valleys from time to time, but. I am a pretty even keeled person, and Robin jokes that I, I don't have a pulse, you know, and um, that's just how I'm, that's how I'm wired. I think, I don't know if it's because of the job or if because of that, you know, I'm able to deal with some of the stresses of the job. I think it's probably the latter, um, but it's just how I've always been. Have you ever seen Moneyball, and if so, what were your thoughts about it? I did. Robin and I watched it together over the winter. Um, you know, it's funny, she, for the first 20, 30 minutes, couple times she asked me like is that how it happens is, is that what happens and then after that point it was she was able to answer her own question like I never hear you talk like that that doesn't happen that's not real you know and uh, um, so I enjoyed it for what it was a, you know a Hollywood movie but you know I mean deals aren't made like that um, you know the scene where Billy or, or uh, Brad Pitt flies to Cleveland to sit down the in the office and the guys are like you know standing behind him like thumbs up thumbs down uh, you know advising Sh Mark Shapiro where Billy's like wheeling and dealing and picking up and hanging up on guys and hanging up on the owner. I mean, that, obviously that's not real. Uh, you know, we're, we're much more inclusive in, in how we involve our people and anything like that. And I remember Dan saying to me, hey, you'll be there a year or two at most. Um, you know, this won't be a career. Don't, don't worry about it. Because being from New York, you know, Texas is the, you know, it's like a different country. You never think about it, and probably vice versa. Football here locally is a lot like what baseball is like in, in the Northeast, where it's it's a generational, you know, hand-me-down almost part of the the culture. I think they, hopefully we're getting baseball into that that uh, thought process here locally as well. But that's where I, I grew up. Where baseball was life and death. You know, every out, every pitch, um, every move by the team, every decision, every player, etc. Um, so there's, uh, that's still ingrained in me. I've tried to like even it out. I'm much, I'm much better now during the regular season than I am the postseason. I'm still, you know, highs and lows of every pitch, but it's a blast, man. I love it. It's a pretty good story about when the Rangers called, where you were, and what you were doing. Can you share that story with us? I know exactly where we were. We were on uh, Bell Boulevard in Bayside in Queens. Got a call from. Thad, who said that Dan O'Dowd, the Rockies GM, wanted to talk to me. So Dan gets on the phone and says, we pulled over to the side of the road, and Dan gets on the phone and says, hey, his old boss, John Hart, had just taken the job, the general manager's job here in Texas, and John called him and asked him for a recommendation, wanted kind of a young analytical type that wanted to get his hands dirty and get in at the ground floor and do a little bit of everything, and Dan had recommended me. And I remember Dan saying to me, hey, you'll be there a year or two at most. Um, you know, this won't be a career. Don't, don't worry about it. Because being from New York, you know, Texas is the, you know, it's like a different country. You never think about it, and probably vice versa. And I remember while I'm on the phone with Dan, I wrote down a piece of paper, Texas question mark, and showed it to Robin. And she nodded as though, you know, we never really talked about it. And she nodded as though that was a place she was interested in. Um, I interviewed with the Rangers probably two weeks later. The winter meetings were in Boston that year. Uh, I like to joke that I, that, you know, I was uh, second biggest acquisition that, that to uh, Carl Everett at that, those winter meetings. But um, remember the salary that they offered offered me at the time. Uh, I told my father and my dad, who had been very supportive at that point, 
told me, no, don't take it. So I ended up lying to my dad and telling him, telling him that I had negotiated for more money, even though when I'd asked for more, they said no. You mind me telling how much, tell, tell me how much it was? Uh, I think it was 30000 at the time, which with my student debt and whatnot, it was, and you know, having just done an internship for a year, and moved to Boston, moved to Denver, now moving to Texas, what, you know, it was, I, I was, we were running up the credit card bills a little bit. And I remember my, you know, I, I, think I lied and told my dad I was making, you know, five or ten more than that, and uh, um, you know, fi just kind of betting on the come, basically figuring that eventually it would work out. In your inner circle, who do you lean on the most, and what strengths do they bring to the organization? Don Welke, um, you know, so had uh, you know a career and a half in the game, uh, still has as much energy as any of us. I mean, he kind of jokes that you know it's him and the kitty core. He calls us, although now we're all you know. 35 to 45. I'm not sure it's quite the kitty core anymore, but um, you know, as a scouted for a long time, um, done a lot of different things, been part of a lot of things. He's got a he's got a great feel for a player's. Uh, I was gonna say makeup. It's really a competitiveness. You know, he'll he'll kind of do that and hit his chest when he really buys into a guy's makeup and his his drive and ability to to compete and fight through adversity. Uh, he'll use a term. He'll say "special" when he thinks a guy has a chance to be, you know, better than than average. Uh, you know, chance chance to be a championship caliber player. And that might not be a superstar, but it might be that he's really good at whatever he does. Uh, so when he does, when he either does this or he says "special," you know, the rest of us kind of perk up, and we've learned our lesson to listen to those because uh, his track record's pretty good. You know, obviously Nolan. Um, you know, Nolan's got a different perspective, having played the game. That's one thing. You know, our our inner circle, Scott Service, had been here and left. He was really, he, he and Wash were the two guys that, you know, I, on a day in day out basis interacted with that had played. Uh, AJ, you know, who uh, is really involved throughout the operation, but heads up our, our whole scouting department. And, you know, I think has really revolutionized not just the way that, that we do things and changed how we structure our scouting department, but really as you look around the industry, how how scouting's done uh, on a, on a different level, but he's involved in, in everything uh, player personnel wise, and and then some. Uh, he's made some really good staff recommendations as well. Uh, Josh Boyd runs our pro scouting department, but also is really involved in the Pacific Rim. And you know, without him, we don't have Colby Lewis. We don't have Hugh Darvish. I mean, he's made some you know, tremendous recommendations and um, had a direct impact on the big league club. No, I can keep going on and on. Obviously, Thad, you know, is, is uh, involved in, as those other guys are involved in everything that we do, and is one of the best, you know, people person, people people, I guess you'd say that you know you can come across, and a really great feel for other human beings and what motivates guys, and um, you know, whereas some, you know, if a, he's got the softer edge to sometimes where I, I don't I don't have that feel for it, and so you know, it's a good it's a good balance, and it really helps us utilize our resources to make good decisions. It's bizarre, you know, it still is. Um, I hope I never get used to that part. Uh, you know, um, you know, the guys all give me crap about it. Somebody stop and ask for my autograph. Don Welke's the worst and he'll, he'll actually crush me for it. Sometimes I'll watch in the office, you know, trade deadline and things like that. We'll, we'll stay in the office a little bit more. Uh, occasionally I'll go down to visit with either Nolan or ownership, update them on anything, or, you know, if a deal's coming down, I want to, you know, brief them on something. Um, uh, but for the most part, we're, he we're here during the game. I know you're a native New Yorker. Can you talk about your upbringing in Queens, what that was like? Where to start? Grew up in, in Queens, not too far from, like, St. John's, um, just past where the subway stops. You actually take a, a a bus to get to the subway, which was a little bit of a pain in the butt in, in high school because I went to high school in Manhattan. So I'd take a bus to three different trains to get to the to get to school. You know, basically third generation straight New York, and, and that for me, growing up, I, I figured I would never live anywhere else. And now the more I've been away from there, the less likely I am, I think, to move back. Uh, at least, especially with kids at this point. After graduating high school, you went to Cornell. Why'd you pick Cornell? Well, I, I applied to a few different schools. I wanted to stay, I didn't want to stay at home, but I want to stay in the region, you know, the Northeast. So I applied to schools, I want to say, from as far away from Virginia up through, um, you know, the New, up the New England area. Um, Cornell was 
you know, one of the better schools I applied to, I think that and Penn and UVA were probably the three best schools I applied to. Didn't get into the other two, did get into Cornell. And one of the things that is attractive in New York is that uh, so Cornell has seven undergraduate colleges. Three of them are, are built on state land, and so they get some financing from the state. And so I got an Ivy League education at you know, more or less a, a state college price, and it was just too much to pass up. You and A.J. Prell are the head of your scouting department, met at Cornell. Can you talk about uh, how far you guys go back and how your relationship developed? Uh, we pledged the same fraternity. Um, which is funny to say now, I feel like uh, I'm almost embarrassed to say it, but yeah, we were, we were both in a fraternity there at Cornell, became very close friends, um, and then as we lived together over the years, you know, he, he was focused from day one on getting into baseball. I mean, he did an internship with the Phillies, uh, I think sophomore year, um, and he was, I mean, he was gung-ho. He was going to find a way in. I didn't think it was realistic, so I didn't actually pursue it right out of the gate, but he ultimately did, and it was through his you know, job and experiences that led me to the game. After the 2010 season, you were given the Baseball America Executive of the Year Award. Did that mean anything to you? Yeah, it did. I mean, um, uh, flattering, but also a little embarrassing, you know, in that, uh, you know, I, what we did, I mean, we, I was really proud of what we did that year, especially in light of the fact that we were in bankruptcy and had the ownership change going on, a lot of things, a lot of distractions off the field that could have could have held us back. Um, when I say embarrassing, though, I felt like it was singling me out when, you know, all the moves we made that, that year, whether it was Cliff Lee or Benji or, or Colby Lewis or Vlad Guerrero, I mean, there, we had a lot of, you know, things that worked for us. Every one of them had a lot of other people behind it, you know, and so I, I viewed it as more of an organizational award, and I hope people took it that way. Um, uh, it was it was rewarding. Don't get me wrong, and I you know I'd love to have it happen again, but. You know, it, it really is a reflection on the, the work of a lot of people, not just me. People in the organization say you have a sense of humor. You just don't often show it publicly. Would you agree with that? I probably am a little bit of a different person, you know, on and off camera. Um, you know, I, we have a good time. Our, we like to have a good time, our group. And there will be times we'll go out on the balcony and, and throw the football around in the middle of the day. and. You know, try to take the guys out, and then after you know trade deadlines or drafts, you know we all go out and, and blow off some steam. Um, but on, you know, on camera, just I don't know if it's a, a defense mechanism or what it is, uh, but I'm, I'm probably am a little more guarded and uh, let it out a little more in private. Whether you want to admit it or not, you do sign autographs. Have you come to terms with that? It's bizarre. You know, it still is. Um, I hope I never get used to that part. Uh, you know. Um, you know, the guys all give me crap about it. Somebody stop and ask for my autograph. Don Welke's the worst, and he'll, he'll absolutely crush me for it. Um, you know, again, it's like one of those flattering things that you just, you never prepare yourself for. You never, I certainly didn't get into baseball because I was hoping to, you know, get recognized. If anything, I like to be lay low and, and not be recognized. But, you know, I try to look at it as it's, it's a commentary on what we've done, what we've accomplished on the field, and the fact that, you know, while Nolan and Wash and myself and obviously the players are a little more recognizable, you know, there's there's varying degrees. I'm not I'm not at that level, but you know, again, there's so many good people kind of behind the scenes that you know, I just happen to be the the one that gets recognized.